I'm Jamie Carragher, and you are listening to The Last Word with Stan Collymore. OK, I'm absolutely delighted to be up in Liverpool. It's match day one of the Premier League. And uh, who better to, uh, to pick the brain than somebody that's made 508 Liverpool uh, appearances, uh, two or three very early ones alongside yours truly. That's how long ago and how long <laughs> his Liverpool career was. Two FA Cups, three League Cups, one Champions League on a very famous night in Istanbul. Two Super Cups and one UEFA Cup. Jamie Carragher, delighted that you can join me. Um, let's go straight into the to, to Liverpool against Norwich because they open up the season. Incredible to win the Champions League, doing what you guys did in 2005. And Liverpool's pedigree, as anybody that's got any association with the club, uh, Europe is incredible. Six Champions Leagues, double Man United, six times more than Chelsea and, and, and other clubs, English clubs that have won it. Um, but I guess the question is, asking you as a top quality analyst and ex-pro, is that after the season that Liverpool had last season, and you're looking at Manchester City, can they go one better in the league? Or is it going to be arguably the toughest uh, task yet in the Premier League? I, I think... Uh, Liverpool's going to be an interesting one this season for everyone in the game to analyse because I think in some ways a lot of people will say at times this season they've gone backwards because you can't do more than what they did in the Champions League and can they get more than 97 points? I don't think they can. That doesn't mean they can't win the league but I think what they need and other teams need but especially Liverpool because I think we'd agree Liverpool are the next best after yeah. City. They need City to come back to the pack. And I think the big worry for Liverpool and the rest of the top six is this 96, 97 or 100 points what City got uh, a couple of years ago, that's the norm for Pep Guardiola. If you go to Barcelona, if you go to Bayern Munich, you come to City, that's what he does. Now, I'm saying Liverpool and other sides will need City to come back to the pack. I'm not sure they will. I think as soon as Pep Guardiola leaves, they will. Because this is just unheard of what they're doing. And it's unheard of what Liverpool did last season in terms of points tally. But for Liverpool to win the league, I think they need City to drop back. And I don't really see that because Guardiola's history tells you that it doesn't happen. And last season, I don't want to use the word lucky because I don't agree with that. But I, Liverpool made the most of everything that sort of went for them. And that they were, you could say they were lucky with injuries, but then you could say, well, that's because the sports science team are good or Klopp's training's good. So you can look at it both ways. So it's not just luck. Seven draws, though, would suggest yes. that if they'd have turned one of those into a victory, they'd have won the title. So there, there, there is wiggle room if they hit the benchmark that they did last season. Difficult it is. I mean, it's, it's difficult to explain to people when you're chasing a team that, like you say, is hitting or getting near 200 points, that you're looking for every possible angle. Seven draws suggest that Liverpool could if they replicated last season, um, overhaul Manchester City. Draws kill you in the league. People think it's defeat, it's draws. Because if you actually think of last season, with about 10 or 12 games to go, maybe a little bit more, Tottenham was still in for the title. Tottenham had lost five games at that stage, but he hadn't... If you remember last season, Tottenham didn't draw a game. I don't know until about March or mm. April. And that shows you how important it is. City lost four games, but I think they only drew one or two. Two, yeah. It, it's the draws that kill you, and that's what... Actually, in 2009, we uh, finished behind United by three or four points. We only lost two games, which we thought it's an unbelievable achievement to go through a 38-game season. Liverpool only lost one last season. We only lost two, but we drew too many games. So when you go back to pre-season, we had a chat with Jürgen last week, and he called it a couple of weeks ago, and he was very positive for the season ahead. Transfer window is now closed, brought in you know, players like Harvey Elliott that undoubtedly will go on to be very good uh, players, and he's a big Liverpool fan. Is that when you go back into the dressing room the next season, having had an amazing season and only lost two games... Does everybody look around the dressing room aware of how difficult it's then going to be? Because I see James Milner, we want to go for it. You can see the passion and the drive in their eyes, Jordan Henderson. But they must also look around and say, we've also, we've also got to get almost to perfection to win this. Yeah, I, th I think that's how they, how they will feel. But they will feel on the back of a Champions League win. That, that's, on the back of a Champions League win, I can only use my own experience of what that does for you as a player. It gives you a bit of arrogance, in a nice way, mm -hmm. football arrogance, I'd say. So they should believe. Because when 
we won in 2005. I never believed I was good enough to play at that level or to win that. But once you've done it, you think, well, I am now. Yeah. And the Liverpool plays the same in that squad. So before they were probably watching, you know, Barcelona, uh, Real Madrid, obviously they got there the year before, all these teams, you actually think, am I as good as them? But once you've done it, it should give them that extra little bit of something this season, uh, really. But yeah, I think they'll be well aware uh, that they will have to go near to perfection this season. I think the second half against City in the Community Shield sort of give everyone a lift in some ways because the pre-season hadn't gone great for Liverpool. Listen, there's no big deal the pre-season, mm. but I think the way they sort of should have gone on and won the game against City, I think has given everyone a little bit of added belief in terms of the support that uh, we will run them close again. Because I think beforehand people were thinking we got so close, but will, will you get that close again? But as I said, I still, if Liverpool got 90 points this season, it'd still be an amazing total. They've had a great season. It's just that you're coming up against one of the greatest sides, I think we'll be saying, in the next two or three years when Pep goes of all time. Thoughts uh, on the window? Um, closed yesterday. Firstly, are you a fan of it closing before the season starts? I am, because everybody knows what they've then got, rather than having a situation of players coming in and being integrated in the group. So your thoughts on, on the window closing before game one starts? And let's look at the best bits of business. I mean, Pepe, Luis, Tierney going into Arsenal. Uh, Lo Celso, Sessegnon at Spurs. Rodrigo, Manchester City, Cancelo as well. Delphi Wobi down the road at, uh, at Everton. Uh, Harry Maguire, Juan Bissaka, Daniel James. Uh, players like uh, Yuri Tielemans at Leicester City. Are you a fan of the window closing the eve of the season? And who's done business that you think is going in the right direction? Well... <laughs> In terms of the job I'm in, I'm in. I'm not too bothered when the window closes, but I can I can totally understand managers thinking I want it closed. But in terms of us, it probably gains more talk and points, mm. more excitement. It goes on longer, if you like. I just think the, the the slight problem with it is is that you're you can still have players who can leave. So you're still not getting away from that fact that there might be people unhappy in the dressing room, they could go abroad. I know not too many players do that now these days. But also in terms of the top clubs, does it give an advantage to Madrid, Barcelona, Munich, different big teams, Paris Saint-Germain, that they've got longer to bring someone in, uh, really. So I'm not too fussed either way, uh, to be honest. In terms of who's brought people in, I actually am looking at Arsenal. And not so much as in I think they're going to challenge for the title. I still think they'll, they'll be there or thereabouts, top four. But I think the pessimism after the Europa League final and, and how far away they were from Chelsea, really, in that game. In the background of potential protests and yeah. not happy with Stan Kroenke and yeah. the board and, and, and the, general the, malcontent. This talk of £40 million to spend, which is not a great deal of money. Now, maybe you could look at it and think, well, maybe Arsenal are quite clever. Actually telling people they only had 40 million because it looks like they've done a... I don't know exactly what they've spent. They've got the Awobi money back, so maybe it is around about that figure what they've spent now. But... They seem to have done a lot of business and come out of it a lot healthier, I think, than people were fearing. Or certainly Arsenal fans were mm. fearing. There was certainly, I think two or three weeks ago, I think there was letters getting written to the owner, wasn't there? I've seen it on social media, and it's Stan Kroenke and stuff like that. So I think the position they're in. And the David Luiz one uh, is an interesting one, really. Are I, you I, a fan of him? I no, I'm, I'm not I'm really. Gary Neville because... Yeah, I think they've opened the front door, Arsenal, and gone, oh, there's somebody just down the road that we can bring in. Yeah. And it, all, it reminds me of kind of like a, a rival second-hand player. If you're a Liverpool player, if you're Man United, if you're Chelsea and Arsenal, you want your own, your own people that you can mould into your own club. Not just kind of off the peg, we'll get him because he's available. And what also does it say to people like Rob Holden and Scrooge and Mustafi that somebody that is widely regarded at times as a bit of a liability in terms of his defending comes in as on the on the eve of the season? Well, listen, I'm not a massive fan of David Luiz. Uh, probably people know that over the last few years. Uh, I think at times he's better than what people talk about. You know, let's not forget he's, he's played in the middle of a back three that mm. went on to win a title with, under Conte. He was very disciplined there. I think it helped him being in a back three. But I can totally understand it from Arsenal's position. He lost Koscielny, who's the, the experienced man. Mm. And I'm so disappointed in Koscielny because... You saw Ian Wright going in on him on yeah, the video. Yeah, but I just... It, Do you think that was a bit crass? Yeah, but to be honest, I didn't see the video. Oh, the video of the shirt. So basically, yes, he swaps yeah, the shirt yeah, and people have that. gone, well, all right, you've, yeah. you've, you've, you want to go, but there's a better way of doing yeah. it than taking off an Arsenal shirt and revealing a ball. Yeah, shirt. I just think... I thought he, he was one of those players where you look at his different club and you think, 
you know, he's he's a good lad. Yeah. He's you know, he's a good player. Probably coming to the end, but that happens. That's fa- f- fair enough. But you just think, don't leave like that. You, you've you've put a good solid stint in there at a top club, and I just think they've lost the experienced one. So they brought another experienced one in. It's not cost them much difference in money. You're talking about. I mean, Mustafi's nowhere near good mm-hmm. enough for that club. So there's other young players there. Uh, is this, and, and, is and, this and, a front three? Uh, Obama, Yang, Lacazette, Nicholas Pepe that he spent £70 million on that is so much better than their back four that you're going to be going and doing Monday night football or games over the weekend and they're going to be doing teams over three, four and five at home, 80% of the Premier League, but still losing against the very best because the back four are not up to well, it. Well, I read, I read something uh, that, that I found interesting because a lot of people were saying, why, why are Arsenal spending £70 million on Pepe when they need a centre-back, uh, whatever they need? And the feeling was at Arsenal was that they've got a great home record. If you actually look under Emery and the away record's awful, the more thinking they actually need to score more goals away mm. from home. <laughs> I think they're probably thinking, you know what, there's not a lot sometimes we can do uh, mm. defensively. And to be fair, I don't know how many great defenders are out there because they've actually got a, a young kid, haven't they? Is it a, a French lad or something they've sent back? Yes. Uh, uh, Sal- uh, Sal- uh, yes. Uh, Seven, it's like but, 18. Yes, but I think they think this lad's going to be the real deal. Yeah. And the Luis thing's just coming to happen. But I don't think there is a dearth of great centre backs out there. So it's not easy. But I, I think they feel he's not scoring enough goals, would you believe, away from home. So that's maybe something that, that can add to them, certainly away from home. They've got the Spanish letters as Celebos. Yes, uh, 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 Cebalos from Cebalos, uh, Real Madrid yes. on loan. So. So I, I think they've actually done quite well. Them. Yes, it's top heavy. And maybe it'll be, be, be exciting to watch. Really, I've never really had Unai Emery down as that type of manager. I've always, it reminds me a little bit of Rafa in that he, you know, very studious to see him on the side of pitch, always very focused. Uh, so you'd expect that maybe his team to be a bit more organised, really, not conceding goals left, right and centre. But it looks like that's probably what we're going to get. But I, I think they'll really go for the top four. Brief thoughts on uh, Chelsea, United and Spurs. Um, can they, I mean, for, for we've, we've spoken about Arsenal, we've spoken about um, uh, clubs like Liverpool that are probably the only real title challenger to Manchester City. But Manchester United, again, lots of discontent. Uh, they've, they've brought in Harry Maguire, they've brought in Daniel James, Wan-Bissaka, so youth, a new Manchester United. Lukaku's gone. They haven't brought anybody in. Um, are we just going to be... I mean, it seems to be a bit of a circus, which if you you know had an association with Liverpool, is, is great, because it's like any chaos there is, is, is fantastic. But it, it all doesn't quite seem well at Manchester United. No, but I know th- from being at Liverpool and where we've had times where outside the top four as a player. And I'd always say it's never as bad as you think. And sometimes you just get one player or you know a couple of players, one leaves, and, and, and something just lights up. I'm, and I'm not saying that takes you the title, but I don't think Manchester United are miles away, the way people talk. I really don't. And in some ways, I admire what they've done and the, the signings they've made. Uh, really, um, you, you, could you replace Lukaku? But I think it's about time Rashford was given his goal through the middle. I've, I've been saying that for a while. Put him through the middle. Let's see, let's let's see if Marcus Rashford is good enough to be Manchester United centre forward. He may not be. You know, he may he may always be that player who, who plays wide a little bit, plays through the middle now and again. But is he really going to be that 20, 25 goal a season? Man, let, let, let's see. Let's have a look. Really, uh, the defenders they brought in in, in Maguire. Uh, I think it's a good signing. People questioning the price tag, but it's just uh, he had a five-year deal. They knew you were desperate. It, it, was there anyone better you could get out there? Probably not. People say delict. But he's going to sign for Juventus before United. So uh, could they have brought maybe one or two more in? Perhaps that's what the fans are complaining. But they've spent more than than anyone. But I, I don't think United are miles away. Uh, the way people talk, and I, I think it will eventually take them one or two, or two or three, maybe four transfer windows to get ri- rid of the bad apples, players who are not good enough, don't suit the way Oli uh, wants to play. He's going he's gonna to want to play like the top teams play, fast energy. So right away you look at it, Wan-Bissaka going up and down that line, Rashford through the middle James. now. James, actually, great pace. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see them challenge for the title, of course. I think they'll have a fight on for top four, but I certainly don't think they're as far away as people think. Um, word on Chelsea, Frank Lampard that you know very well, one of that sort of generation of players, huge names, household names, Premier League, international. Um, two transfer windows they can't really be active in. They've let David Luiz go. Um, interesting season for them. Yes, I, uh, I don't think Chelsea make the top four. I, I might say worry for them, not worry for them, but I just think I'm doing me, me a newspaper co- paper column on it, and I, I think they've lost the best player in the league. 
he was for me. He was me. Well, certainly my favourite player to watch in Eden Hazard. And I think they're now the left with a a front three or sort of the four or five or six names who will figure in that front three. I don't think any of them get in the other top six as elevens, uh, really. So I think I think they're a little bit short. Will and they benefit from having? Virtually no expectation this season. I mean, yeah. I say that no expectation. They're Europa League holders. They've got a big name manager, Jody Morris, who you know as well, has gone back. And they've still got very good players, but nobody's expecting them to win the title. No, no. I think the thing will be, I think Frank and Frank and the team and Chelsea will have had a really good season if they get top four. I think they'll miss out. I think the big thing they've got to be careful of is maybe an Everton or a West Ham or a Wolves or a Leicester sort of join the make it a top seven if you like and maybe Chelsea slip out I don't see that happening but I certainly hope uh, but I certainly believe Frank Lampard should not be getting questioned at all really if if Chelsea are just outside the top four and things like that because he's took a job one year managerial experience probably probably the toughest time to take the Chelsea job mm. you can't buy anyone they're not they're not the Chelsea of old in the, in the players that they have I actually think Chelsea did miraculously well last season in terms of getting to a cup final Europa League win and finishing third be t- behind two teams who got record points ever uh, so I know there was a, a discord between the manager and the supporters so I understand that Frank, uh, Frank will uh, bring that together but, but I don't think it'll be easy and I think uh, I think it's important that people like ourselves give him support not because he's English or he's uh, our mate or we play during different things like that because because it is difficult circumstances and he is a young British manager coming up against the best in the world in managers in terms of Pochettino, Klopp and Guardiola. And this is a lad who's had 12 months at Derby. So, uh, yes, you could say Chelsea have done him a favour in terms of giving him this big job. I think he's done Chelsea a favour because no top manager was going there. Punditry, why? So often now players go one of two routes, managerial or managerial stroke coaching or punditry. With the career that you've had, the identification of being at Liverpool for such a long time, winning trophies, playing for different managers, why punditry? Well, uh, when, when I got to 30, it, through my 20s, I was going to be a manager. If you'd have asked anyone in the Liverpool dressing room who would be a manager before anyone else, before Xavi Alonso, before Steven Gerrard, Robbie Fowler has now gone to Australia, before all these people, it would have been me. That would have been the because I watched everything, read everything, and I still do. There's definitely the impact the Liverpool job had on Rafa Benitez and Gerard Houllier, two biggest influences mm. on my career. Definitely seeing them at the end was a little bit, oof, that's mm. what the job does to you. I was then debating over the two. I took me coach, started taking me coaching badges, and I did TV just before I finished. Enjoyed both. I was then offered a coaching role at Liverpool on basically to be Brendan Rodgers' assistant manager or as coach or assistant mm-hmm. manager while I had a year to go on my contract. First time I met Brendan Rodgers, I said to him, oh, this, was a, over a, this was a phone call. He just got the job. I was on holiday. I had a chat on the, the phone half an hour, 40 minutes about football ideas. He said, would, would you like to join me coaching staff? Well, I said, that'd be brilliant. He said, because number one, I said, I'm, I know I'm not really going to be in your team because... This this was Brendan Rodgers was coming in. I was thirty five. He must have been four. He was only like five or six years yeah. older than me. So I didn't want him coming in thinking, worrying, thinking, oh, if I put Jamie Carragher on the bench or that. So I wanted to make it as easy as possible for him and say, listen. I but you know that happens though. That that's why oh. legends aren't parachuted yeah. straight into their yeah. own club is because they look after three or four defeats and go, yeah. he's gonna get yeah. the job. Yeah, but I meant more in terms of actually playing. So I didn't want him thinking, I've got to leave him out. I've got to play him. I said, listen, I'm, here, I'm in your Europa League team. I'm your car and court. I just want to make sure I have a nice... I said, I'm, I'm retiring at the end of the season. There's no debate, I'm retiring. He said, would you join me coaching staff? I said, it'd be brilliant. That for me, you know, a little insight in me last year. And then I can decide at the mm. end of the season what I want to do. And uh, when I met him face to face, he changed his mind, which is fine. He, he brought Mike Marsh in from the academy. So that sort of opening. So sometimes people say, why this or why that? Sometimes it's what falls in your lap. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. So if, if Brendan Rodgers would have said yes, I'd have had 12 months coaching experience. And probably once you've done that, it's hard to say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to go to Pundity. So I'm sure I would have felt, and who knows where I would have gone. Do you Half, want to be a manager? Do you have an aspiration no, to be a manager? Not you really. see your mate Stephen, Stephen Gerrard up at Rangers, Frank Lampard, Derby, Chelsea, John Terry, assistant manager at Aston Villa, Jonathan Woodgate. Up at Middlesbrough, spoke to Sol Campbell two days ago, starting at the lower end, and he said, 
I said to him, why do you want to do it? I said the same thing. Why don't you want, why do you want to do it? Why don't you go, you know, and, and be a pundit or have an ambassadorial role and have an easy life? You've given the career a, 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 a great go. Take a step back or something. And he said, until I do it and give it a really good go, I'll always, that it'll be like that itch that you want to the scratch. Mm. So do you have that with, with management or yeah, coaching? Yeah, I, I think at the end, when I say the end of my career, you know, if I, maybe again to my 50s and 60s, I probably will back and look back and think, I'd have loved that experience as manager. But I can't say right now, I want to be a manager. I love my life. <laughs> I, I, and punditry, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think I'm very, very lucky because there's a lot of people who we class as pundits now mm. in the game, and it's brilliant, but it's because of the, you know, the rise of the Premier League. There's people all over the world, mm. you know, even now, podcast, radio, TV, different stations. And the reason I say I'm lucky is I think I've got the best job. Mm. Because I think I'm on the best show, not because I'm on it. You know, Monday Night Football is a great show to be able to go into dissect uh, real football. It's not just opinions, which which is fine and great, and I give plenty of them. Did that make a difference to you that you've got the technological platform, but more importantly, you've got the time to be able to um, almost show what you've learned as a footballer, a, a coaching hat on, a, a managerial hat on, in a studio? Yes. Yes, it's almost, I mean, we actually speak about, me and Gary Neville speak about it, it's almost, you're like a coach without a team yeah. in some ways, and that you're going through other, other teams' stuff, if you like, and listen, it doesn't mean we get everything right, but I think if I was working for another channel, and I was doing one game a week, or I was just doing the Champions League, it wouldn't be enough, mm. whereas with Sky, I'll have probably two games of the weekend, so I'm prepping before that, watching everything, so Monday Night Football... I will watch every single game live over the weekends. I'll watch Match of the Day. Basically, you watch every other program yeah. to make sure, what have they done? Could I do that better? They've missed that. Or they've done that and they've done it well, so we can't do that. So you're permanently... I feel part of the game. I don't feel mm. like I'm on the outside. I feel a really big part of the game. And actually, I think the role that I'm in is, is one of the best. As I said, I think I'm, I'm lucky there. I think in some ways I'd probably be stupid. To actually throw that away and go and start in, in, in the lower division somewhere as a manager. And people say, oh, great, but then I think, what a job I've got, what a life I've got with my family and kids, the stress of results. Because I used to batter myself as a player. I was too hard on myself as a player. And sometimes I say to myself, did I enjoy it enough? I didn't. It was almost like relief when we won with Liverpool. I don't know, was that because I'm just used to being around Do you think that comes with age as well? You can look back a little bit and go, well, actually, now I'm, you know, 40s and then 50s and 60s. I actually do want to enjoy life rather yeah. than kind of like have that constant torment of, yeah, of competing with yourself. It Definitely. I mean, you didn't play well. You got beat. It ruined your next three or four days. And, and as I say that, I think I'd be like that as a manager. That's the personality. I'm, I'm very intense. And, and football for me, to be honest was just about winning. Mm. It just it was about winning. I didn't care how we did it. It was about winning. And I suppose if I was in coaching or manager, I'd probably be the same. And a result can ruin your next few days. And it's that roller coaster up and down. And as I said, I think I probably was too hard on myself as a player. And it's not. It's nice in some ways, not having that that sort of constant. And I want to say the ups and downs. The ups are never as good as the downs are bad. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a lot more the other way, really. So. Uh, so I, I don't see myself going as a coach, you know, managing. So you're a competitor. You work in a studio with another competitor. He's a Manchester United legend. You're a Liverpool legend. I love the kind of, there's a tension there. Is that a natural tension? Is it a bit, as they say in comedy, where you're kind of like, you're having a little bit of like to and fro. There genuinely seems to be a bit of, you're still Man United and you're still Liverpool. Mm. Does that, does that, continue to make you want to compete against him and what's your relationship like with him Gary Neville yeah I mean my relationship with Gary Neville well there was no relationship at all as a player and uh, there wouldn't have been no relationship for the rest of our lives if I hadn't joined Sky so when you walk in the room for the first <laughs> time and it's like you're the two big hitters at the kind of like yeah. you know the big Premier League broadcaster is it a bit awkward is it kind of like well we just no, got to put I mean, this by do you just kind I, of wing it I think it's I, I think it's amazing when as a player, you've always got your guard up. You know, you go to England, you, you don't want to tell someone else what you're doing in training, you're playing in the weekend, it's all very guarded. And everything just goes away when you stop playing. That's not just with, with Gary, with anyone. You have a pint with someone or you meet someone or you're on the road with someone and you're just chatting them. But what did you think when you played us? And what did you, oh, well, we thought that about that player. What did your manager say about him? And it's like, it all gets forgotten. Relationships are a lot better, uh, really. But with Gary, in terms of the punditry, it was a... Uh, the, the thing... I think that makes it work is we're both very, very similar. And what I mean by that is 
we can challenge each other and go very close to the bone. And when the camera goes off, it's like it hasn't happened. Mm. Now, you know yourself doing punji with different people. Sometimes people aren't too receptive to being really... If they give an opinion and you go right back at them and challenge it, and you put them on the back foot, they feel in some ways that maybe you've embarrassed them a bit or you've tried to make them look stupid, but it's not. In the back of my head, I'm always thinking, what's good TV? Yeah. And when you're saying about, is it, I don't know, sort of manufactured, like, it's not manufactured, no, but we're not stupid. You know what makes good TV? You know what I mean? I think we're, we're experienced enough now, uh, and that doesn't mean have an argument for argument's sake, because a lot of the time, actually, I mean, people think we're always arguing, we're not. A lot of time we agree, because we've got similar values to the game. But my God, when we don't, when we, we do see things different, none of us are prepared to back down and none of us will get uh, too, too upset. If, if, I'm out, if I've got a debate and I believe something, he believes something else, and he does me in the argument, he's done me. It's not me going, you made me look a prat there. But then you? when you walk away and you go, oh, and you go, shit, he's done me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but it's a lot. <laughs> but you're still the yeah. yeah. competitive nature, yeah. there. So I'm thinking... Monday night football of an afternoon, we're just talking all the time and different arguments, and I'll think he'll say something, and I'll think, oh, I've got a line for him there, but I won't say it now. I'll <laughs> save that. I'll, uh, oh, if he will please say that tonight, and I'm going to go straight back with that. So that goes on a little bit through the afternoon. You think, oh, I'll hold a little bit back so he doesn't know what's coming. A um, couple more questions. Is there too much football? Uh, Pep Guardiola was in the press conference at Wembley, Man City, and Jurgen Klopp, and asked them both the question. I would straight in with the question H. Because I know that Jurgen had spoken about, look, if you give me five or six weeks with players, I'll give you something special. But if you're giving me five days and players are coming back at different times, it's very difficult. When you started your career, um, which was the tail end of mine, is that, is that football still had a decent break. And even before that, going back to being an apprentice in the late 80s and then places like Crystal Palace in the early night, you would finish in May and you would come back in July and you wouldn't hear from anybody in, in between. Now you've got international tournaments, more international tournaments, players playing across the world in pre-season friendlies, post-season friendlies. Um, if we want players to be able to give their best and entertain us, they need more of a rest, don't they? No, I totally agree. And I'm with Klopp on that. And I think Klopp, I admire Klopp in that way because he's the one prepared to actually come out and say it. And it's, it's something that, the fella on the street will say, the money they get, they should be able to do this. And, and he sort of leaves himself open to a little bit of criticism. But I think people in the game, real, uh, you know, uh, students of the game, if you like, you understand it's not right. There's talk of Mane being involved tonight. I mean, he had a season of 13 or 14 months. And in some ways, that tells me Liverpool squad's not good enough. If you, Really, Mane, we shouldn't be, see, you shouldn't be seeing Mane till after the, mm. the September international break, Really? if we're being totally honest, but it's that vital that Liverpool start well and don't drop points for City. You think we've got to get them back in, and that can't be right. Suggestions that there could be FIFA might weigh in or UEFA might weigh in and have a mandatory break. So you, you have to have a month off. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there is some talk of that, but I think it's one of those rules where I don't, I don't know how you enforce that. If you're paying a fellow 200 grand a week <laughs> and you want to play, that's, that's going to be the end of it. Uh, the midweek... Uh, or the midwinter thing will that make a difference I think it'll help of course it will uh, but definitely there is there is too much and we ask too much of players and I think eventually we're getting to the stage now where there won't be a pre-season I think it's it's actually getting there now and, and I'm looking at Mane actually because Klopp said oh, oh we trained like a few days he only looks alright he hasn't lost too much fitness I think we're going to get to the stage where the it's going to be actually two or three weeks off and you just, it's almost like having an injury mm. and we're just straight back into it. So there's no... They'll be still going on pre-season tours, get a few quid and don't worry about that. But it won't be a case of this, uh, what we think, you, you think you've had having eight or ten weeks off, don't you? And like, Remember we used to come back and... But, but is, it is, important to get the, is it important to have the break? If, if players are managed and they say, right, we're going to take you out for a couple of weeks and, and sort of lower the intensity in training... Is there an argument with, with these guys are bombarded now with social media, 12 months of the year football, lots more travel. Is there an argument that actually we need to protect them to give them a proper break, to just be able to kick back for it, even if it's a couple of weeks? No, I, I totally get it. People think the physical thing, yes, that's a part of it, but it's a mental thing as well. And, and what we ask of these top players now, you, you mentioned on social media, ourselves at Sky Sports. I mean, the game now, the best way to explain it is when I was a kid, I watch cricket. 
the athletics would be on now and again. You'd watch something else and then there'd be a game on. It's like football dominates everything now. It's like took over to, to the stage, but I actually don't even know who Great Britain's athletes are in the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. In, in the past, you knew who everyone was. He does these, he does the forums, he does the javelin. He does, I, haven't, I haven't got a clue who anyone is. Because football's just constant now. Sky Sports news, games every day. So imagine how the players are being involved in that, the social media, sponsors, agents, entourage now. Sometimes you feel like just, just go away, leave your phone and just go away for three or four weeks and switch off because because the game's bigger the media's bigger there's more talk that means that we're constantly probably criticising not criticising or analysing everything so Salah goes two games without a goal it's like a big thing everyone's talking about it where it's like it's not that big a deal but there's just so much there now and I just think the, the constant mental pressures of the top players and that's why I've got so much admiration for your Messi's and your Ronaldo's it's not just producing it's, it's been in that mindset to produce week in, week out, season after season with that pressure. And I think we're getting that now when you, you look at the real, well, certainly Liverpool and City, what they did last mm. year was unbelievable. Every week going out to win. Champions League games, win, 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 win. No one no one dropped a point sort of near the end of the season, which is unheard of. But that's just down to those players and the mental strength. Final question. Um, I saw the little Premier League videos, the instruction videos from Alan Shearer about VAR. Are you a fan? It, it's brought in, it's for contentious issues, for goals, for penalties. Um, suggestion is that it's sort of 99.3% effective compared to 98.2% effective. I'm sure you guys at Sky have been prepped on it and had a look and what the expectations are. Are you a fan? And do we run the risk this season of having some glitches where, again, it becomes a major talking point for fans? I've always been a fan. Uh, I must say, over the last year or two, I've been looking at things and thinking that this needs to get better. It can't stay as it is. We've been to the VAR uh, at Stockley Park, oh, yeah. at, at, at where they do it. We had a meeting there. I'm obviously I'm, I'm commentating on the first game. Uh, Norwich, where it's, it's going to be used. So you're thinking if something comes up, you know, are we, are we ready for that? I have one big problem with it, and that is. I don't think there's any need for a TV screen in the middle of the pitch. And I, I would, I mean, the Premier League are going to be a lot less, or they've said to us the referees will go to it a lot less than other places. Uh, the other things, I think we need to get as many decisions right as, as, as we possibly can. But the thing with the TV screen is that someone comes in a referee's ear and says, have a look at that again. Straight away, psychologically, he's thinking, I've made a mistake. He then runs over to a TV screen. The two benches are there. You've got managers screaming. You've got players running over, getting involved. And he's looking at it. And more often than not, he changes the decision probably 99% of the time. In the game, because people say, you can't, we can't have people re-referee in the game. Well, no, no. The way I look at it is, VAR is part of this team of getting the right decision. A referee would send someone off if his referee's assistant saw something yeah. off the ball. So if the fella upstairs in, in Stockley Park sees something that's right and just says, you made a mistake, change it. Very quickly, don't waste any time because that fella's part of the team. There's no problem with that, this re-referring the game. He's part of the team, do that. And also what it should take away is the descent from players coming over to the referee. Why did No, they, they've seen it, they've changed it. Move on, let's go, let's get on with the game. That's my big worry that this referee going to the screen. But what I would say is, I think it's important people in our position Support it. That's not saying we don't criticise it or we challenge it, but I, we're part, I, I see myself as part of the game. This is something that's trying to help the game. Let's try and help it and understand when things may not go right and push it forward. Now, in two or three years' time, if it's not right for the game, let's be stronger and say, listen, we need to go back because this hasn't worked X, Y, and Z. But at the start, I don't think we should be trying to be clever and criticise referees and criticise this. We're all part of the game. We're trying to make our game better. So let's all get behind it and give the, you know, the officials there as much support as we possibly can. And if we can analyse and critique it where it can be better and maybe make it better for the game, let's do that. But let's certainly not jump on a bandwagon to batter VAR from day one. Jamie, all it leaves for me to say is uh, have a fantastic season. Uh, you and Gary Neville have set the bar very, very high in terms of analysis and punditry. Genuinely love your work. Uh, and let's hopefully, uh, if we can reconvene uh, this time next year, that Liverpool will be bringing home a, a Premier League title. But thank you very much for joining me on The Last Word with Stan Collingwell. Thanks for having me, Stan. Good to see you. All the best, lad.